Whoops. All right, so this is an assessment that I did uh, between our trawl toes uh, surveys and our uh, acoustical surveys. Um, it kind of came about, we were tasked to kind of, uh, they switched my position around a little bit, took me out of the project, put me in the region, and they said, well, you guys might have to lose some programs. And uh, so I was looking for some redundancies and uh, seeing what we could maybe get rid of. And that's where this kind of started, and then I set this up to uh, present it at our last meeting, and I couldn't attend, and so I gave it to the uh, AFS out in Bullfrog that year, and uh, um, I since revised it a little bit, updated it a little bit, and so so that's what this is going to be. It may it may hold a little bit of interest for us. Um, so to understand uh, what we're sampling here with the acoustical and the trawls are open water uh, pelagic uh, threadfin and uh, now gizzard shad populations. They're tightly coupled to our striped bass fisheries. Uh, and so I'm going to give you a little bit of background on the striped bass fishery and then uh, a kind of a timeline and then uh, show just some comparisons between the two surveys. Uh, this was never set up as a uh, as a study to compare the two. It's just going back and looking at the two uh, surveys and just trying to see see where they, uh, you know, see if they were telling me the same things, essentially. Uh, striped bass fisheries, they are the major uh, fisheries on Lake Powell. Uh, this is just showing in, in our 2012 survey, uh, we estimated about 0.7 million were caught. Uh, in our 2009 survey, we estimated about 2 million were caught. Uh, so, you know, this is a huge fisheries for us. Um, we need to do an economic survey, really, and see just how big it is. Uh, we're harvesting about 94% of the uh, fish that are caught, which, which is our goal. Our big management goal for uh, the striped bass fisheries is maximize the harvest. Uh, and as you can see, most anglers that go to Lake Powell say they're willing to catch anything. 25% uh, of them uh, specifically target striped bass. So what uh, this striped bass is is definitely a cyclic fisheries. Uh, it's a boom bust situation. Um, the shad build up, the striped bass come behind them, knock them down. The striped bass start to starve out, and then the shad will start up again. Uh, just kind of a classic boom bust situation. So, what? so what's the transition from? I know it used to be threadfin down there, and now you've got gizzard shad. Those gizzard shad fish? came in in uh, 2000, and by uh, 20. Three were spread throughout the uh, so reservoir. So was that intentional stocking? Or no, that was there? actually the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service was stocking a lake, Morgan Lake, up on the San Juan, uh, and uh, unintentionally just had a bunch of non-target species that they dumped in there. Uh, they were stocking they, largemouth, right? Yeah, they were stocking largemouth, but they had like six other species that they ended up dumping in there. Uh, you know, it was a pond, they were raising them in ponds and they just had all these other... Yeah, that was the Fish and Wildlife Service. And so they accidentally, you know, put all these other fish in there. They made their way down to San Juan and uh, within three years, they were oh, out the uh, So what's that done? Sorry, this... No, no. Uh, what, what's that done to the fishery though? I mean, are they... They get, the gizzard shad get a lot bigger. I the mean, gizzard shad get a lot, uh, yeah, a lot bigger. As far as the striped bass fisheries, what we're finding is the striped bass are still focused on uh, threads. Really? Yeah, but, but the walleye are, are really starting to utilize the gizzards and, uh, you know, quite a few of the other predators. So have you seen changes in water clarity, though? Uh, you know, that's what I keep saying is that we're going to see it. I, I think we are. I think it's getting a little bit more, uh, uh, we're seeing more algal blooms. And that sort of stuff, and uh, uh, I mean that's what's happened with us. You that's know, what happened just about everywhere just where where gizzard shad go. Right. Massive, nasty right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, we're such a big system that you know, it's, you know, it's, it's probably going to take a while to really start while, to see see, see that. But I think that we're seeing. It. That'd be a travesty though, because I mean, the town's always had such such clear, clear water. water. Right. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. that's the situation that we're in. Well, uh, that's where the muscles are. There you go. <laughs> yeah, this is my classic graph. Yeah, this is just great. Nobody's doing this sort of stuff anymore. So, 
uh, saw a little niche there where I could still cut and paste. <laughs> <laughs> you know, this With is scissors and right. The scissors, scissors, and glue. Put it on a put it on a paper. Put it on a scanner. <laughs> so you know, I'm I'm unapologetic about it <laughs> because. So the, what I'm showing here is kind of your boom bust situations in uh, this is from different areas, different years, but you know that first 2001, you know you see just about nothing out there and then uh, you see how thick it can get. 2004 is when we started to really think about integration and uh, we're doing some echo Very integrating nice. there. Yeah, because we think you, the densities there are just too high. Right, right. These are going to be just about all thread fin shad here. This is kind of your typical. Where was that echogram but, from, Dr. Curiosity? Well, well, this is one, two, three, four different ones. Oh, oh, in 2004, oh, it's in Bullfrog in uh, 2004. Okay. Yeah, yeah. All of these were actually from uh, the same uh, area same in Bullfrog. Yeah, Bullfrog Bay. These are just some pictures of uh, of how the fisheries can can operate. Uh, there's no limit on uh, striped bass fisheries. Take take as many as you can. These are I just threw in some big fish stuff. Uh, these big ones they'll leave the school at at about five six pounds and then they just go solo and they start feeding on carp. Now we we think they're also probably feeding on gizzard shad too. So hopefully we're getting that kind of utilization. Seems like your frequency yeah, of big fish has increased. Right, it is. It is. Anyway. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we just took a 28 pounder out the other week, so uh, really nice fish. This one they thought was a world record. This is actually they made the made the mount from just just from measurements, you know. Is that the one that was floating around? Yeah, like yeah, yeah, yeah. They well, these guys had picked it up and they measured it and uh, then let it back, let it sink back in the water, and so they just took the measurements, made the mount. And kind of looking at the girth versus the length, they think it could possibly have been a world record. So. Where's that mount at now? I want to say of sticks, maybe or. Oh really? Yeah. It's a world record now. World. Inland world record. Inland. Oh yeah. Yeah. Say, yeah. 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 This is where we're going to put that houseboat when we do our next there meeting. Sounds <laughs> good. Is that behind the Good Hope I don't bathroom? know. I just grabbed this Wayne. Wayne. I think Wayne it's behind Kirkland. the Good Hope bathroom. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I think I took that. Picture. Really? Really? You could have it. It's just in our files. So <laughs> I, just, I just grabbed it. Okay. Here's kind of a, a timeline in Pound Mint in 63. Stripe bass were put in knowing that we were going to put in uh, uh, stripers because they had already done a fairly successful down in Mead and Havasu. So they wanted to replicate that in uh, um, PAL. By 80 we had our first uh, striper induced uh, shad crash and that's when the cyclic uh, dynamic. No, it didn't really take too long. So then we started doing some management stuff so our creole limits went from 2 to 4 in 83 and then from 4 to 10 in 84. Uh, we attempted to put in some rainbow smelt, and that was a no-no. Uh, new introductions into Colorado that weren't going to happen. Um, then we increased our creel limits again to, from 10 to 20 in 1990. Wayne started doing kind of a hotline, a call-in hotline to try to get people on the fish. Um, then we totally removed the limits in 93. So that was about, what, 15 years or something it took us to... To get to that point, Salt Lake really didn't want to, didn't see it for a long time. We I kept, remember, we kept saying we need fight. to get, we yeah. need to get more harvest, more harvest, and they were just no, no, no. So, hmm. eventually they, they, they saw the light. Then we switched the hotline to a national deal because we were just getting overwhelmed by calls. Uh, then the national people eventually wanted us to help pay for it because they were getting a lot of calls. But uh, chumming was allowed in '96. Just, just for stripers, and you can only use uh, um, the anchovies. Work pretty well. Uh, no, nobody does it. Well, you know, I shouldn't say no. When they used to congregate around the dam, it was it was fairly successful. If you can find a school of them in the winter, you can sometimes get them going. But uh, you know, it's expensive. You got to buy a thing. You can find anchovies all over Lake Powell. Yeah. 
so then we brought in the two pole in 97 and you know a lot of this stuff was feel good stuff we also brought in bow fishing and spear fishing for uh striped bass around the same time and you know hardly anybody does it but it's it's kind of you know you got to do something and kind of get the idea out there that you know we need to maximize our harvest first gizzard shad was collected uh by gordon mueller uh 2000 uh waynesworge.com my boss started a uh website to promote uh, mainly the harvest of striped bass and uh, he gets almost a million hits a year he gets more than way more than our state uh, websites awesome. do yeah yeah it is it is he just blows them away so and it's really been a great tool that's this is why we have 94 percent harvest on our striped bass is because he just he just hammers the people that they have to do that he's also been able to increase our harvest on uh, smallmouth we used to get like 10% harvest on smallmouth real consistently, and they were starting to stunt and stack up, and now we're up to 34%. So, and it's hard to get those bass guys to, yeah. to take a fish, you know. So, but he's been able to do it through this Wayne's Forge. So, anyway, in 2003, we had kind of a, uh, we started this extended kind of shad boom, and that was is being uh, fueled by the uh, gizzard shad that are in the system now. Wait, what was that backup? So you got a big... We started to get an extended boom. We used to get like one year, and I'll show you a, gra uh, a graph. We used to get like one good year of shad, and then you'd get three or four years where you'd have next to nothing. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, in 2003, suddenly we had like four years that were just back-to-back -back good shad years, big shad years. And, and those are primarily gizzard there, shad? Yeah, 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 yeah. It's progressively being fueled yeah. more and more by gizzard that shad. That makes sense, because we haven't been able to get... Redfin's going in Colorado, they always winter kill. They winter kill, the, right. The, the gizzard shad. The gizzards are tough. Stick around. Yeah, yeah. We've got gizzards up in Willard Bay, right? It's quite a bit further north. Just kind of a shad uh, history. The gizzards up there winter kill on some years. Do they? Oh, yeah. Wow. Yeah, yeah. they get knocked back hard. They don't winter kill all the way out, but you know, oh, they right. get a cold winter. On Willard Bay. Like on Willard Bay. Year, on the yeah. North Dog. Yeah. This past year, they they lost thousands and thousands of shad, but the damn things are so prolific there. Right, right. right. Well, and you can see how big they are mm -hmm. in, in the bottom bucket. We I, I think our biggest ones are like 24, 25 inches. And, uh, you know, those are spawners, yeah. and they're going to just stay in the system and keep cutting, you know, kicking out. How many uh, eggs do they produce? Do you have no, idea? I don't. I don't. Um, yeah, but they're going to keep kicking out, you know, young year. So uh, you're, you've, you've always got a, a crop coming up every year. Um, there were some years too where you documented spring and fall spawning of threadfins. Do you see threadfins? Can yeah. Uh, we well, we haven't been able to really document it yet with with gizzards. Yeah, threadfin in real low density conditions will sometimes spawn again in the in the fall. Yeah. So it's mainly they're spawning mated uh, July. Uh, the gizzards are, are, are supposed, to, supposed to spawn ahead of the threadfin. Uh, and we've seen them doing that, but we haven't been, been able to collect any young year that we think are, are really uh, earlier spawns. So. Uh, they're mainly spawning in flows, backs of canyons. Uh, when they migrate out into the open bays, this is when we start to collect them. And, and we do our survey, uh, our trawl survey in July and August. Uh, and they start declining in uh, September. So we sample them at night or uh, on either side of the new moon. And they tend to disperse pretty well in the water column then. We began the midwater trawl survey in 77. Uh, sa samples down the bottom of the trawls running at about 11 meters. Uh, 10 square foot opening, just kind of a typical midwater type trawl. So uh, you're, only, you're only 10 foot? 10 foot by 10 foot. Oh, 10 foot by 10 foot, okay. Yeah, yeah. The bottom of it, it it's, it's, it's centered at about 10 meters depth. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so the bottom of it's down to about 11 meters, roughly. So we run it in July and August, new moon phase. Uh, we're def defining, uh, we're looking our targets, we're looking for a half inch to six inch. How fast are you telling that? Uh, we're going at about, 
Well, we were base it on the RPM off the boat, so we're running 1,100 RPM. Um, it can't be more than probably four miles an hour or something like that. If you go too slow, you're not going to get anything. You know, that's that's we did so. Some flow meter stuff. Yeah, we did some flow meter stuff, and Wayne had kind of worked on this, worked the speed out when they first started towing, and uh, figured kind of about, about how fast that they could go. Physical sampling, we started uh, in 2001. See that little thing on the right hand side, Kevin? Right, oh, that's I see. That's where the Game Boy used to go. <laughs> oh, yeah. That's I the one it. I cut off that rack. Yeah, I guess I never knew what was there because we got it like this and we never. Uh, me and Ryan. Right, <laughs> yeah. So we started out with the 243, we're now into the 241, so it's a great system. Uh, we used to do 15 degree down looking, you know, we did some side scanning and, and it was, it, I don't know, it was beyond me trying to interpret that, you know, I guess you got to work with it enough and and uh, plus we didn't have a side scanner, we had to rent one for, I forget what you guys charged us, but once again the boss wasn't really <laughs> crazy about the hundred dollars I think you guys charged us to, to rent it for a week or so, so we didn't. We didn't continue that. He's got to keep his uh, fishing so, account up. You know, yeah. So do you need to use side looking for these fish? Or well, no, no, no. Actually, if you look at those graphs, you can see they're usually down a little bit deeper than that. So we, we, we really don't. You know, it doesn't sample the top three meters, we figure, very well. But, uh, but yeah, they're generally a you little bit below. Right, 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 right. Well, you know, and when I looked at the data and we kept hitting the surface or else hitting the canyon walls and it was it was really hard to uh for me to deal with it so so i didn't <laughs> how i yeah solve most of my problems in life uh, <laughs> yeah it doesn't work I'm, I'm gonna <laughs> so we've got a number of areas that uh we're sa sampling the big bays on the open water mainly because that's where if you have excess shad that's where they move into at night um uh, we do 20 transects, uh, 150 meters. Now I'm doing 200 meter transects, so they're, they're pretty uh, short. Uh, we're using target tracking. Tried a little bit of echo integration, got some mixed uh, results with that. We'll, uh, I think I've got a graph on that. And once again, night survey. Run around the new man. This is the boat that we're using, a 28 foot uh, twin screw. It's about an eight foot beam. Uh, maybe seven something so it's really a pretty stable platform for us to do acoustical uh, work off of This is just Lake Powell. It's about 180 some miles long um, Has as much coastline uh, shoreline as the Pacific Coast um, So it's really a big system when we first got into acoustics I was kind of hoping that we could get some population estimates, but it really didn't happen uh, Gordon Mueller with BOR came out and did some extensive hydroacoustic stuff with his uh, his system, and he kind of came to the same conclusion. Uh, I compared his stuff with our trawl stuff one year, probably about 89 or something, and both of us were estimating open water uh, pelagic populations at about 200 million, uh, plus or minus 200 million. <laughs> so that's where we were with that. So we decided to use it just like we did the trawl, which is it's just an index. Index. Right. We index it. So uh, these are we have the lower sample site in Wawi Bay. Our mid is Bullfrog, and our upper is uh, Good Hope. We do sample some other ones, but these are the three core ones that I used to just to do this comparison. Yeah, it's oligotrophic. Uh, more productive on the upper end, and then as you come down uh, the lake, it's it's a lot less productive. Also, as you're coming in from the side canyons, it becomes less productive. Also, this is our uh, trawl data, and you can see we started in '77. You can see that first shad crash in '80, uh, and you can see how it kind of has bounced around. And you hit 2003, and that's where we started to see the. Uh, uh, the gizzards coming into the system and it's kind of really reset this whole system so now it's going to be interesting to see if we maybe go back to uh, what we originally had is you know as we get more and more stripers out there more and more walleye you know we're, we're beefing up our predator base and so you wonder if they're going to start to hit it hard like they did before 
So, yeah, they're more resilient fish. I mean, yeah, the gizzards. Trouble crashing. Right. Like yeah. That. Yeah. I don't think we can. You know, we certainly can't crash the the spawners. They're just too big. You know. So what happened in like 2012 where you had that just really? Is that a actual crash or is that just a flip? You know, looks like 2011 had a big number. Right. 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 Yeah. Yeah. In 2012, it 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 it, it was down. It crashed. And then 13, it was an okay year. Yeah. But the fishing's better during the crashes. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. When the stripers start to get a little bit hungry, then they really get aggressive. Yeah, it's, it's sometimes best to get them on those years when it first crashes. Yeah. Our um, management, of course, is to maximize striped bass harvest. It's a, this is a top down control system. So that's really the only option we have is to maximize harvest. Which is, you know, it's easy to sell fisheries when you. You go out there and catch a hundred fish, and, you know, and may and maybe get a you know a trophy. So, so this is comparison uh, comparing the uh, trawl with the acoustics, the catch, and I, you know, it's really saying the same thing. I'm, you know, this is really uh, as far as an index go. Uh, you know, I think they're both they're both pretty well uh, <coughs> pretty equal. Um, I think we get a little bit better, better resolution off the uh, acoustics at uh, low densities. Um, some of those years, like say in 2012 with the trawls, that represents about four fish. Uh, and probably with the acoustics, we probably hit maybe, maybe 100, 200 targets. So 50% um, of the acoustical transects, uh, the mean depth of the pelagic population is actually below the trawl sample. We didn't know that. I'll show you a graph. The next graph I think shows, or maybe three or four down the road, shows that, that our trawl is really going above uh, where the bulk of our uh, shed are situated. So um, we could drop that trawl, you know, maybe put out some more line or something, but I'm just, I just don't want to do it since we've got a trend line going back to, yeah, trend line going back to 77 and um, you know, I hate to I hate to change, and since it isn't just an index, I think we're going to end up keeping it the way it is. For its depth densities, uh, high densities, they they average about 10.8 meters, and a little bit lower at uh, lower densities. And I just mentioned our upper three meters aren't really being sampled, but I don't, I don't think there's a lot up there. This is why well, this is just the same graph. This is just. Uh, based on the different areas. This is Wawi. Um, everything looks good there except 2003. Um, oh, yeah. In 2003, this was the thing we're looking at here is our trawls. Uh, these are our trawls from uh, July, August, and the acoustics are being run the next month in September. So, what happened there is because BOR was running the same was running some hydroacoustics up in Wawi too at the same this same year and a bunch of shad moved in in September in uh, the Wawi area and that's why you see that acoustics uh, quite a bit higher there. No, that's why you see the trolls being quite a bit lower. Yeah, yeah <laughs> right, 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 yeah, right, 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 right. The acoustics are, 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 are correct here. Bullfrog, about the same thing. Uh, we had a, a trawl issue in uh, 2010. I found out that we had a, had a, one of our uh, depressors was reversed, so it wasn't deploying really right. I didn't realize it till the next till the next year. But yeah, it, it threw this this uh, 20 uh, uh, 2010 data off. But also, you know, it's it's laying out pretty good. So, uh, and here's good hope. Once again, you see the 2010 that was doing the same thing. So, you know, I think you know, I feel comfortable saying that. You know, they're saying for management purposes, they're saying basically the same thing. Mm -hmm. yeah. This is showing uh, if you look at that top line, which is the 10 meter. Uh, Mark, you can see where most of our uh, shad are actually 
below the level of where the trawl's running. Trawl's running down to about 11 meters, so we're missing, at least on these high density years, you know, we're really missing a lot of that. So you're able to target track that stuff? Is that... Well, um, let's see, what uh, years... Let's... No, 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 2004, that, this one, we're, we're definitely echo-integrating that. Oh. Um, Although we target tracked it too, I mean, you know, yeah. I remember talking to you and and and, 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 and yeah, 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 it was kind of right on the split. But the experts said I could target track. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah, yeah, it looked ugly, but yeah, close it out. Yeah. That one on the left hand side, that's. We start getting fairly dense and barely like that's what it's looking like. That's what it's looking we like. We actually had some that were a little bit denser, but not quite as dense as, say, the San Juan 2004. Right. Maybe about halfway in between. That's when I started going, man, are we, are we getting to the point where... Where then, you got to think about it. Well, you don't even have to think about it. That's, <laughs> yeah. that's more, more right. like what we're seeing. It was, yeah. it was happening easy time attracting. Tracking them, yeah. Well, it appears like it is too, but I, you know, I was worried about it. That, uh, but yeah. Yeah, you can get things starting to break down. Right, skipping. Yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah
So the interesting thing, and I see this in our other species too, and I've just never been able to understand this, but if you look at when you, like when you get two or three good years, you see that, that spike in condition the first year. But then even though there's still excess fish out there the next years, you still, the condition starts dropping down. You see that in the walleye, you see that in the smallmouth. I've never been. Is that been. just because you're, you're getting better recruitment on those walleye and strippers so you actually have more of them? Yeah, you? but we still have plenty of, plenty of forage out there. You know, that's what gets me. Is, you know, hmm. Even if we have more of them out there, we still have, we're still showing excess forage. So hmm. I can't, I, you know. It's, yeah. Getting smart. I don't know. Or maybe they just overload that first year. <laughs> they overload that first year and then, and, and then they, I don't know. But I see it in all the other species too. Yeah, yeah, it is. And I've just never been able to. Even really. the bass, you see? Yeah, well, yeah, well, not so much in the bass. The smallmouth we do, yeah. The smallmouth and the walleye, you see. Yeah. These are just, I'm just going to run through a couple quick other indices that we use just to kind of check to make sure that what we're seeing in the trawls are actually uh, the same thing that we're seeing in the, uh, it, it, it is actually happening that we're getting these peaks when uh, we think we are. So this is just shad abundance versus the occurrence of striped bass and the, uh, the occurrence of shad in the stomachs of our gillnet caught striped bass. So. This is the same thing, currents of sh uh, shad in smallmouth stomachs. So you can see it's kind of young year, uh, total length of young year smallmouth is correlated with shad abundance. And there's total smallmouth bass catch off the gill nets is also correlated with shad abundance. And, and this is true of walleye and just about all the other species. When you have big shad years, we, we catch a lot more fish in the uh, gill nets. You know, and, and what we think it is, is that they're just, there's a lot of feed out there, so they're just more active, mm -hmm. you know. And so that we're just catching more of them in the net. Or there's not more smallmouth out there. It's just, there's just, they're more active that time of year. So. Catch a young year striped bass, same thing. Okay, here's some size stuff. I didn't know we were going to do a lot of size stuff here, and, and or, or I'd have brought, brought some more stuff. Um, bigger fish up lake, it decreases as you come down. And then here's some estimates, the acoustical survey on top, um, and then the trawl survey uh, size estimates. Ours is just kind of the opposite of what Kevin was showing, yeah. Um, you got two things going here. One is the acoustical surveys a month later, so they've got a little bit more time to grow. And also, as those fish get bigger, there's probably a little bit of avoidance in the trawls. Yes, that's right. You know, so you probably have have those two things. And then uh, past that, I can't make any excuses for it. So, uh, but it's still, you know, it's following the same mm -hmm. trend line. Right. You know. And so they're about 30 millimeters larger is showing from the acoustical surveys. This is just using Love's equation. So, you know, it would be easy to throw some kind of a correction factor in there. Did you not draw? But these are little, right? Is that no? These are little, little, yeah, so yeah. You know, these are just, yeah, these are, so these are, so these, these fish the, don't get that big. Yeah, you don't Six see inches quite the not. separation right. of those small sizes, and they are rocking. The right. It would work fine. It's just not that different. <laughs> right, right. It much right. Difference. Yeah. So it'd be nice, you know, I just don't have a crew when we're doing the acoustical survey to be able to pull some trawls, right, but it would right. be nice to get them from the same, you know, we could get them the same area. Yeah, because those suckers grow fast. Right. Sad. Yeah. Well, well, the gizzards do now, the thread fins don't. So, oh. you know, the thread fins don't get bigger than six inches. Right. So you said you yeah. the trawl survey when? The trawl surveys are done in July and again in August, and then uh, September is when we do the... So those things can grow 30 millimeter inch. Well, the gizzards can, yeah, 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 the gizzards could be. The thread fins probably aren't growing that much. Yeah, yeah. So, do you want to look at it when you're up from down and help you yeah, do it? Heck yeah, heck yeah. Round up a couple yeah, people. Yeah, get a couple people and get out there. Right. And the fish yeah. Yeah, it's awesome. good. Yeah. September's good, man. Yeah. Well, I'll bring the equipment down <laughs> yeah. and we'll do it. Yeah. And then this is just the same thing, just the other two areas. So, um, 
not quite as neat as far as relative to each other, but there's a couple years there where they're actually almost right on the money. So, and I don't did don't do you know the size doesn't mean that much to us anyway, so it's not not that. But it good. might going forward because those big gizzard shad are not prey. Right. And, uh, right. Yeah, the gizzard shad are good prey for a year and a half, and then they outgrow the cat limitations. But those bigger gizzard shad aren't in the pelagic zone anyway. So. Right, they're not. They're not. They're these are just fishes from half half inch to uh, six inches is what we're dealing with. Yeah, yeah, the big fish can avoid the the trawls really easy, and they're also just not out there. Uh -huh. You know, it's the small fish that are out there. Once they get big, then they're going going down into the sides. This is just a little echo integration, uh, one that I threw up there. Uh, like I said, I wasn't really uh, too confident about it. Um, seems like the integration stuff, we're estimating a lot. This this, this is 18 tr tracks that we did, and, and, and you know, estimating quite a bit more from echo integration, which I think is, is what you saw, right, Pat? I mean, isn't that pretty common? Yeah, that, I mean, Yeah. Right. Right. It looks like it's you know, on most of it. It's kind of running the same pattern anyway. Maybe a, not so much the first few transects. I used a sigma scaler. I was I was taking each transect and looking at the size right, right. I had so from each transect and using that as my yeah, no, scaler. Uh, so, um, yeah, but, you know, I don't have much experience with it, so, I, you know, I could have been. You know, the one we did for Good Hope that you did for us was, uh, I thought, was quite a bit better. Now, you put that correction factor in there, which I don't know if I used I here. Think, yeah, there was, I think you had, like, a correction factor of six or something that, uh, yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. So I'd have to play around a lot more with integration before I felt comfortable with it. Right. Well, I guess we'll see where your density is going. Right. Right. So what, what size are you looking for? Is this all sizes of fish? That are this is going? half inch to six inches. What half we're six. doing. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's what we consider our our uh, four inch size, and that's as big as the thread fin get. You know that time. You know, you know that's as big as they're going to get. The gizzards and and the gizzards really they're not any bigger than that in open water either, because once they get bigger than that, they're out of there. You know, then their mouth, you know, is 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 it's it's migrating uh, subterminal as they as they grow up. It starts kind of terminal. They feed on zooplankton, then it goes under, and then they go down and feed in the uh, bottom. You know, whereas the thread fin, you know, they got a terminal mouth. They're feeding on zooplankton the whole time. So you cut open those, those thread fins, uh, the gizzards, and they're just full of mud. They're just a mess. Yeah, detritus. yeah, yeah. This feeding on the bottom on uh, on detritus. Yeah. So. So anyway, I did some pros and cons of our midwater trawls. Is the good things they give us a, a good index, mid and high. Uh, you can get the species size composition, uh, all the typical stuff everybody sees. Uh, Low initial maintenance costs, you know, the net doesn't cost much. If you calculate in the boat, that's a different different story. But uh, cons were just weaker estimates at low densities. Didn't Couldn't generate a, a population estimate with statistical confidence. Required a larger boat, minimum crew of three people. Processing time was about 45 minutes to tow, and you can't sample the entire water column. So you can't get depth distribution data, and the acoustical survey stuff. We, we returned uh, good indexes at all the densities. Uh, got good depth distributions. Uh, can sample entire entire water column. Uh, size estimates I thought appeared fairly accurate. Uh, larger target sample size. We can run a lot more transects. I like the real-time printout, paper printout. Me and Scott are still <laughs> hanging on to that. 
Yeah, I can do it by myself. A lot of, a lot of times I run the whole survey by myself. Uh, and you can use a smaller boat if you want to. So it also failed at the cons where it failed to return the lake-wide population estimates with good statistical confidence. Uh, top three meters weren't being sampled. Uh, equipment expensive is fairly expensive with the hydroacoustics. Uh, although you know, for us, we're splitting it three ways. So you know, it hasn't been bad. Uh, and you need to proof it with trawling anyway. So if they made me drop one of the surveys, I, you know, I, I, I'd probably drop the acoustical survey. But I'd love to keep them both. I think that was it. Yeah, that's it, guys.